Bhakti is uh, love of the self. And uh, we pointed out that there's a common misconception that um, bhakti is a particular special path. Bhakti is not a special path, although um, with a certain qualification we can call it a path. But bhakti or love, bhakti means love, love for God. It doesn't mean love for objects. If last night we pointed out that the normal person, and everybody has a normal person in them, every, in every self there's a normal person. <laughs> that normal person loves objects. And that and we described or discussed what an object was. An object is anything other than you, existence, consciousness. Mm -hmm. that's, that's an object. And a, and a normal person uh, loves objects because he or she feels that those objects can make you, make them complete and whole. But um, that love is not called bhakti or devotion. You could loosely call it devotion. I'm devoted to money or sex or security if you want to, but we use the word devotion or bhakti to refer to love of God, love of the self. And we said that God or the self is everything that exists. It's, it is existence and all the objects in existence. That's bhakti. And this bhakti uh, is of two types. Dvaita bhakti and advaita bhakti. I'll just put in a few Sanskrit terms for those of you who are new to show you that, that I'm teaching Vedanta. The Sanskrit, it means, this comes from the scriptures of Vedanta. It's not any, it's not my philosophy or my ideas or anything. I'm just teaching Vedanta. And Vedanta is uh, written, in, written and spoken in Sanskrit. And so we use a few of these words uh, just to make sure that you understand that there is a source for this other than James. See, in our tradition, uh, we don't trust the gurus. <laughs> no, we, we trust the scripture. The scripture is the words of Ishwara. And uh, whereas most of the people in our tradition are, uh, teach the scripture. Occasionally, there's someone who thinks that their, the scripture is theirs. And they, te te they treat it as if it's their own teaching. And that's, uh, you can't be a Vedanta teacher and do that. And in the modern uh, non-dual world, Everybody has their own teaching. There is no standard teaching. You can claim to be enlightened, you can claim to be a non-dualist, and you can have any ideas you want based upon your own experience. And that is uh, maybe helpful to some people occasionally, but uh, it's not very helpful. It's confusing, particularly if, a, if an individual's teaching does not set you free and uh, reveal to you the fact that your nature is non-dual love. <coughs> if their teaching doesn't set you free and show you that you are non-dual love, then you'll go to another teacher and you'll hear another teaching. Huh? Isn't that right? You'll hop, uh, well this teacher did, it didn't work. Maybe this teacher's got a better teaching. Oh, that one didn't work also. I got a little something from this I didn't get from this one. 
But which is the truth? He says this, and he says this. Which is the truth? And after you've been to three, four, five teachers and haven't discovered, haven't gained freedom and non-dual love, freedom and non-dual love are the same. Non-dual love is not different from freedom. Okay. We will show that. Then you, you're out of luck. You just keep hopping from one teacher to one teaching, teach, one teaching to another teaching, because they're all experience-based, they're personal teachings. And you end up more confused than when you began. So if you teach Vedanta, you teach Vedanta. It is it's nothing to do with me. Huh? Okay. I want you to understand that. That's why we use the Sanskrit words. Because you can check. You can check the scripture, whatever it is, and you can see if what I say is in harmony with the tradition, with the original revelations. You can check. And if something I say is incorrect, you should tell me. We invite you to question. This is not I'm trying to tell you anything. I'm trying to help you see something. Our method helps you to see the truth. So you should be critical and thinking all the time. Now in the traditional bhakti yoga darshana. A darshana means a point of view. The, the traditional idea or point of view of bhakti yoga is dualistic. It's called dvaita bhakti or dualistic bhakti. And there the god that you're worshiping Huh? is thought to be something other than you. Hmm? There's no identity between the worshiper, the person, the devotee, and the object of devotion. There's no direct connection. There's no identity between the two. the problem. So a devotee who has the idea that God is someone else, sitting somewhere else in heaven or in a transcendental state or a transcendental sky somewhere, or has gone beyond the world. Like in Buddhism you have this chant, gate gate, paragate, Parasam gate, bodhe swaha. It's beyond, beyond, gone beyond, gone beyond the beyond. But to that, whatever it is that's beyond, uh, my, I bow, uh, that great knowledge, that great wisdom, I bow. Well, what about me? <laughs> what about little old me? Okay, that's wonderful. God is great, but what about me? Am I great? Hmm. Vedanta says you're great. And it's not because you're different from God, it's because you have an identity with God. That's called non-dual, devotion. Hmm. The bhakti point of view is that <coughs> God and the devotee will never be the same. It's an experiential form of spiritual practice. The best you can hope for if you practice dualistic devotion is what? To get close to God. Okay? The doctrine is called samipya. Samipya means closeness. So, and it's very similar to the Christian's idea. The Christians have an idea that you can never become God. You never have an identity with God, 
But if you're a good little person here and you do everything right, you get to go to heaven and there God is sitting and then you get to right, have some relationship with God in heaven perhaps. Maybe God sends you to heaven or hell. You might only just have a short time to talk to God and then off you go either to heaven if you did good things and go to hell if you did bad things. <laughs> and yoga, the philosophy of yoga is also dvaita, dualistic. It's called a darshana. There are three, three basic darshanas or points of view. Yoga darshana, huh? bhakti darshana, and vedanta darshana. That means three different ideas. Yoga and bhakti share are both dvaita darshanas, dualistic darshanas, dualistic ideas. In yoga, huh? you contact or, or, or join or merge into God in the form of some experience. The, the, the yogi, which is equivalent to a devotee, that yogi does certain practices, pranayama, asana, pratyahara, dhyana, dhyana, so forth and so on. Yamas and niyamas follows various ethical and moral things. That yogi does all these actions, and all those actions lead to samadhi, Savikalpa Samadhi or Nirvikalpa Samadhi. In Nirvikalpa Samadhi, you, you extinguish or blow out all your sense of duality and you live in this particular state. But since you're not there, what good is that Samadhi? Hmm? I, if, if, huh? See, the idea there in, 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 in yoga, in the yoga view is what? that I have to stop being me to get into this state of non-dual awareness or non-dual consciousness, non-dual love. But if I'm not me, then how am I going to live my life? <laughs> I, huh? did, I, did, I, did God put me here so that I could not be here? Huh? Why, why did God bring me to this earth? God brought me to this earth, what? For a reason. And that is to experience this life and enjoy this life. And if I, what, am not here, if I have removed myself by merging into this state where I don't exist, where I'm non-existent, I've killed my ego and killed my individuality and no longer have a body, then what's the point of being here? There's no point. <laughs> you understand? Well, actually, you are actually here when you're experiencing your Vikalpa Samadhi, but you can't live your life. There's no world for you. And the idea in that, that uh, in yoga is that, that the world is a bad place. That the world is a suffering place and that you want to get rid of your suffering, you have to leave the world. See? To go beyond this world. And melt or merge with God or merge with Shiva. Shiva and Shakti have a big cosmic sex beyond this world. That's the idea. But non-duality doesn't mean that Duality is a problem. Non-duality and duality are not opposites. Okay? If you're, if you're non-dual, you can also be dual, and if you're dual, you can also be non-dual. There's no contradiction between the two because they're in different orders of the one reality. Is there, is there any contradiction between you and your thoughts. In other words, when you're thinking, do you not exist? 
Huh? No. No. <laughs> you certainly exist when you're thinking. So how does getting rid of your thoughts or your ego huh, have any effect upon you at all? How does the presence of your thoughts negate you or dismiss you? How does the absence of your thoughts negate you or dismiss you? It has no effect, does it? Remember, we pointed this out last night we, when we analyzed the relationship between you, consciousness, yourself, and your thoughts. And we said that your consciousness, yourself, which is love, which is pure awareness, existence, love, that's present before your thoughts appear. That exists while your thoughts are appearing and it remains when your thoughts go. Which means what? The self, you, are not affected by your thoughts. You're already free, you're always free of your thoughts, of your feelings, your emotions, your actions, your life. Your life is an object. You have the person that you think you are, your ego, is an object. It's sometimes present and sometimes absent. So there's no contradiction between what? This person that I am and who I really am. So I don't have to do anything to fix, change this, to get rid of this person. Okay? We wanted to get this out of the way, huh? And we, we said the reason people believe this, this dualistic idea of getting rid of your person or your personality or fixing your person or something like that is because they've been told there's something wrong with themselves. They think they're, huh? They think they're sinners or bad people or stupid. They think they're stupid. Why can't I be happy and successful? I must be stupid. There must be something wrong with me. I see successful, happy people. I'm not successful and happy. I must be stupid. No, you're not stupid. <laughs> There's absolutely nothing wrong with you at all, this person that you think you are. So in this Dwaita Darshana, this dualistic idea, according to this dualistic idea, I need to get rid of the person. And we say, no, that's not so. If you are a person and you're focused on material objects, you see here it's a materialism. All objects are material. Your problem is not that you're a purpose, but it's not that you're loving. It's not that you're loving. It's that you're loving objects. <coughs> you're not loving yourself. <laughs> Understand? There's another option beside loving objects. Security, pleasure, virtue, power, fame, whatever. Whatever it is you want in the world, there's another option. Your love can go to yourself. And we're pointing out here, this text is points out here, why your love should go to yourself. Because uh, it sets you free. What? Of the need to love and be loved. That's the fundamental duality that people have. Everybody here wants to love and wants or and or wants to be loved. One of the two. Or both. Something you want to somebody to love and you want somebody to love you. That's huh? What a problem. It's a big problem. Why is it a big problem? Because uh, the object is not always present, is it? Whereas yourself, we said last night, is always present. And yourself is the most lovable thing there is. Why do we say you are the most lovable thing? Because everything you do is for yourself, for the sake of yourself. So that means you love yourself more than anything, isn't it? Every, everything that you love, that you want, you want to please yourself, to make yourself happy. huh? That's why you want things, to make yourself happy. Now, what does that show? That shows that you love yourself most. 
you only love the object for the sake of the self. You don't love the self for the sake of the object. Huh? You, don't you don't love your wife for your wife's sake. You, you love your wife for your own sake. You don't love your husband for your husband's sake. You love the huh, husband for the husband's sake. This uh, bhakti yoga is, all, yoga is all about relationships, love. We're talking only about love, relationships. That's where this whole problem comes. See? And unless my relationship with myself is okay, then I'm always going to have difficult relationships with people. My mother, my father, my children, my boss, huh? my wife, my kids, my lover, my friends. I'm always going to have problems in those relationships are not going to be satisfying. That's what we're talking about. Huh? Unless my relationship with myself is understood and appreciated, and unless I love myself first. When you love yourself first, what happens? Everybody gets loved at the same time. Why? Because yourself is everything that is. So there's no contra there's no duality in loving yourself alone. Of only loving yourself. There's no duality in that statement. That's what people say. Oh, that's very selfish, James. You're only concerned with yourself. What about everybody else? That's very self-centered. Well, yes, it is very self-centered, but it, it so happens that this self that I love is everybody else. Huh? See, people, we're talking du duality and non-duality, what the relationship is. People are not out there. There's, there's nobody outside of you. There's no, there's nobody else. Have, have, you, may, you may have at times thought there were other people. There's no other people. Now what a statement, my God, James. What, what are, are you, are you goofy? I'm a little goofy. That man says there's no other people. But I see other people all the time. Everybody's other. There's me and then everybody else is somebody else. He says, well, huh? No, there's only, there's only me. And how do we know that? See, this, is going, this will be a little difficult for you. Where do you experience me? Am I sitting here in this chair? Where, where am I? Where is, where is my location? Where do you locate me? Am I in this chair? Hmm? Um, yes and no. Hmm? Yes, I'm in this chair, but no, I'm not in this chair. Hmm? So... Now, how can I understand that? It doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? Huh? Uh, what assumption do you make that makes, that puts me in this chair? What assumption do you make about yourself? In other words, who do you think you are that causes you to think that I'm sitting in this chair? Who is it? We covered it last night. Yes, correct. Sits in the chair. Yeah, that's correct. That's right. If if you you are your body, then I'm in this chair. Okay. Is that true? Is that always true? Is that the only truth there is? What about your body? Where is your body? If my body's an object to you, okay, 
Is your body an object to you or are you your body? Correct. She said, my body is an object to me. Isn't that right? Now, if my body is an object to you, to you and your body is an object to you, then am I sitting in this chair? Huh? See the logic, huh? You, no, you can't argue with this logic. This, okay? Yeah, you're sitting here. <laughs> or, or, or I'm sitting in you. You don't experience me over here. You experience me in your mind. If you're over here experiencing me, and you're over here experiencing me, it's going to get rather crowded over here, isn't it? <laughs> you know, huh? You'll all be gathered around experiencing me, and then the people in the back, they won't be able to experience me because they'll be hidden by you, won't they? <laughs> huh? So the people in the back won't have any experience of me. But Vedamurti sitting in the back row, he experiences me the same as Leon does in the front row. Why? Because experience takes place in me. The knowledge and the experience of James or any object, and this is true of any object, takes place in my consciousness. Hmm? Yes, yes, correct. Now, let me ask you this. You have to think now. I'm not telling you, I'm asking you to think and understand. See if it's not true. Check your own experience and see if it's not true. How far away is your consciousness from you? What, is there a is there a distance between you and your consciousness? Hmm. No. No, that's correct. The answer is no. There is no distance between me and my consciousness. If that's true, and it is true, the scripture says it's true and you're from your own experience. You validate what the scripture said then is my body or your body, is there any separation or distance between you and your body or between your body and my body? Is there any distance? No. If A equals B, A means the body and, and the consciousness, huh? If those two are equal, in other words, if, if I'm experienced here in your consciousness, and B equals C, my consciousness and me equal the same, are equal, then C equals A, doesn't it? Huh? <laughs> huh? <laughs> it's difficult. It's a little difficult. It's a little difficult. But it's true. If A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C, then my body equals me. There's no difference between me and my body. Or you and your body, or me and you, or any object. Because every object that you experience, you only experience in your consciousness. And your consciousness is not separate from you. So every experience that you have, every object is just you. you say, I know, I understand how hard this is. Because that, that's not how I think, is it? I don't, that's not how I think. I think I'm experiencing something other than myself when I experience an object. When you're experiencing James, you think you're experiencing something other than yourself. That's called duality. 
that duality is only a belief. Duality is not a fact. So when I have this notion that I'm separate from you, that the objects are separate from me, or that you're separate from me, I'm suffering from ignorance. I'm believing something that isn't true. My whole life has been that, hasn't it? Huh? No wonder I have all these problems. Because all my life I believed that I was separate from everything and everything was separate from me, and that's not true at all. No wonder life is suffering. <laughs> now what you're going to say, I know what you're going to say. Well, but I don't experience it that way. Hmm? I don't experience non-duality. I experience duality. Well, you cannot experience non-duality. Because <laughs> it's not an object to be experienced. You can experience objects, duality. You can, if I'm the body, then I can experience your body. But you cannot experience yourself because yourself isn't an object of experience. Yourself is the subject, the non-dual subject, in which all experience takes place. Does, do any of your experiences take place outside of you? No. That means what? It's like in a dream. You, maybe you can understand this better if we use the analogy of a dream. Huh? In a dream, it is the dream mountain and the dream uh, sun and the dream river and the dream people and the dream me, is that made out of some other, other substance than out of your own mind? You know when you dream of your boyfriend or girlfriend in a dream, is that really about the, your real boyfriend that somebody else? The dream people tell you, no, it's not, and it isn't. It, that dream person, the dream mountain, the dream world, is just your own mind taking the form of all those objects, isn't it? Nobody else experiences it. Huh? In fact, nobody else experiences your life, because it's only taking place in your own mind. Huh? Isn't it? Well, in, the, in a similar manner, this waking state is just a dream. Everything you're experiencing, you're only experiencing here. Your mind is what? Creating this world out of yourself, not out of the objects. You, it's true. Yeah, it's true. But you think that what? The world is causing everything to happen. No, your mind is causing everything to happen. Understand? I know, it's very difficult to get your mind around this. It sometimes takes people two, three, four years. I had one fellow who was 18 years I was teaching him, and finally, click. <laughs> Then there's the mind, and then there's karma on top of that. Pardon? There's the mind, and then there's karma on top. No, the karma's just in your mind. There's no karma apart from your own mind. Car like, for example, uh, animals don't have karma. The only people have karma according to your actions, and the actions that happen are just what you think about the actions that happen. Karma is just a thought in your mind. There is no actual karma. It, but it does feel like, there's, feel like things are happening, but where does your karma happen? It happens in your mind. 
Huh? Your karma doesn't affect me. I've got my karma. <laughs> so it only happens in your mind, the karma. There's an, this yourself has no karma. Yourself is called akarta. Self, consciousness, existence, love, sat, chit, anandam, it has no karma. It's because it's not a doer. <coughs> it doesn't do actions to produce karma. The mind, your mind and body, they perform actions and therefore they create karma. Karma is the, huh? They create results. And those results are called karma. But all those, all those actions only take place in your mind. Understand? So the difference, uh, I'm, t I'm saying all this because to understand this text, we need to understand this fact about duality and non-duality because we, we're in, we want to end up here, don't we? We want to end up without any sense of separation and loving ourselves in the world completely. And we're starting here. <laughs> We're starting here with the belief in that duality is real, and we're going to end up over here, huh? Understanding that reality is non-dual, and free of karma, and what? And loving ourselves and all the objects that appear in us unconditionally. So that's the goal. And, huh? So Vedanta says that. This duality is, is what? Is only a belief born out of ignorance of, rea of the nature of reality. So to get from here to here, we're going to have to go through these intermediate stages. And of course, we don't want to do that. Why not? Because that's, that's a big job. We want instant enlightenment, don't we? Huh? That's why the, so many people uh, go to these instant enlightenment gurus. Why all these instant enlightenment gurus are so popular. Because nobody wants, nobody, they, they say, oh, you can just go right from here to here. You, don't, you can skip all this. Huh? And that's very appealing. It's like going for a coffee in the morning. You don't, have to, you don't have to fix your coffee. You just have to get on the phone and call the kiosk. And then you drive your car. And when, and when you get there, you just drive through and they give you the, the, the coffee. And, and what? You're automatically, your account is, is Dutch. So you don't have to pay any money. You don't have to fix your coffee. You just have to drive by and pick up your coffee. That's, huh? In America, it's like that. People don't even get out of their car. They don't touch the coffee. They just call up, or they have their order already in the computer there. So at 8.03, they put the coffee on. At 8.05, I drive up, and I reach out the window. Oh, I do have to push the button on the window. I reach out, and they <laughs> hand me the coffee. I put it, and I drive off drinking my coffee. No effort involved in it. You see, I don't have to go buy the coffee. I don't have to fix the coffee. I don't have to clean the coffee pot. I don't have to wait for the coffee. I don't have to go through all of those steps to drink my coffee. It's all instant. And so, so they're telling us that, oh, oh instant enlightenment. Just, you can just get it. That's all. You just sit here and bing, one day it will happen. <laughs> And in the bhakti darshana, the bhakti idea, what is their idea? They have the same idea. Their idea is, there's nothing I can do to get moksha, to get free. To get union with God. Their idea is union with God. To merge or melt into God, there's nothing I need to do. Why? It's not up to me, it's up to God. So it's only God's grace. So what do I do? I just sit and wait. And somehow magically, for some reason, God is going to deliver my 
merger, my enlightenment, my freedom, my love, my non-dual love, it's going to deliver that one fine day when God feels fit. Or not. Huh? Or not. Or not. <laughs> And the emphasis is or not, because God, does, huh? God doesn't deliver freedom to you or love to you. God doesn't do that. Why? Because God already sees you as God. God knows you're God. God knows you're free. God knows your nature is love already. So God doesn't think you're lacking anything. So why should God like suddenly come out of the sky and give you the great big prize, the big enlightenment prize, the big non dual Why should God do that? Because God doesn't see there's a problem. You're the one that sees you're a problem. But this dualistic idea is that what? This is too big a problem. I can't do anything. It's all up to God. That's lazy. They're, these people are lazy. At best, they'll say, oh, I can, I can go and light a candle for God. Oh, I can, I, that I can do. I can go to the church and light a small candle, and I can say, thank you, God, that's nice. Hmm? Or I can say the Lord's name. Hari Rama, Hari Rama, Rama Rama, Hari Hari. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare. And you don't realize that it's God that's chanting that name. You think that God hears you. God is hearing you say God's name and God is somebody else, somewhere else, and he's going to come and give you blessings. And you feel good huh, doing that. Why? Because God inside is enjoying but you don't know that that's, that feel good is God enjoying hearing his name. That's, now you don't know it's all you. Understand? So yoga and, and the yoga of love, bhakti yoga and yoga, what we call yoga. Yoga means what? <laughs> Chitta vritti niroda. It means removing your stuff. Getting rid of your thoughts and your, your vrittis. Your vrittis means your stuff. Your karma, your, your hang-ups, your problems. Now, we're all for yoga, mind you. We're going to see, because here we got yoga up here, you see? We got yoga in the picture. But yoga is not a magic pill that's going to jump you from here to here. Yoga is going to do a good job for you. But what kind of job is it going to do? It's not going to make you free or give you non-dual love. It's going to prepare your mind for what? for understanding that you're non, what non-duality is. Bhakti yoga, is the devotional yoga, is dualistic yoga, that prepares your mind to understand what non-duality is, who you are. And yoga, Patanjali yoga, jyan, the eightfold path, that prepares good, excellent. You need to do that. We've got that in our program here, in our Vedanta program. Definitely here. That's going to prepare your mind huh? to what? To understand that I am non-dual love. That the I, myself, is of the nature of love. Parama prema swarupaha. The self, me, I, word I, is Parama prema. Swarupa means the nature. Its nature is what? Parama means limitless, non-objective love. Prema is, is the love that makes love love loving. <laughs> or the beauty that makes beauty beautiful. Things are beautiful. Why? Not because in themselves. They're beautiful because there's another light shining that makes them beautiful. And that's called prema or consciousness or you. So you're the source of everything. Okay? And this person that you think you are is non-separate from you. Even though you are free from that person. So to get from here to here I have to go through these steps. Now, this second step we talked about last night was informal devotion. That's 
personal devotion. This is an optional step. Probably most of you don't worship God as a person. Don't have a personal deity, do you? Who, ha who has a personal deity here? Oh, I'm the only one. I have a personal deity. Oh, Carl. Yeah, good, good. It's optional. In India, in India, everybody's got a personal deity. Pretty much. Most everybody has, because their culture is, is based upon Vedanta. And so personal love of God is built in. Now, what's the advantage of, uh, and personal love is not bad, huh? It has certain advantages. So we're not at all uh, against having a personal deity. You see, when you have relationships, when you have love relationships with people, whoever they are, whatever, every, actually every, love, every relationship is a love relationship, isn't it? Because love is all there is. There's only love. There's only you. So every relationship is a love relationship. But huh, there's some problems in love relationships, isn't there? If you love a person, we're talking about loving a person. Like, you're, you know, whoever it is. What is the problem? The problem is that people are unreliable. They're not present all the time, available to love you all the time, are they? <coughs> and in fact, they're, they're, they're often critical, aren't they? Huh? So, sometimes when you love somebody and you, and you go to them, you have something to say or something to ask them, they, um, they refuse to pay, uh, give you what you want. They refuse to pay attention to you. Huh? Or they criticize you. They judge you. They ignore you. Huh? They reject you when you want some love. In fact, when you're dating, that's a good example. Isn't it always hard to make that first phone call? Huh? They make it easy on the match.com and so forth. They try to make it easy. Huh? But it's difficult, isn't it? Why is it so difficult to, to make that first contact? It's difficult because you're afraid of being rejected. Right? What if that person does, I'm attracted to you. I see your profile on the computer screen. Oh, mm, yum, yum. <laughs> <laughs> I can see getting together with her. Mm. I think I'll give her a call. You type something in. And now you're waiting. Oh my God. What, how, what's she going to say? It's going to be a thumbs down or a thumbs up? <laughs> huh? If it's thumbs up, then oh. But you never know, even then, do you? Because if you type something else, it may be thumbs down. Huh? You want to always want a thumbs up whenever you make a, isn't it? Whenever you make a, a statement to somebody you love, you want them to understand you. That love is understanding. You want to be appreciated and be understood by the other person. Now, so people are real unreliable for love, to get love. Maybe they're there and maybe they're not. Maybe they like you at that moment, or maybe they don't. They're not even, their minds, their love is not even under their own control, actually. Whether they love you or not is controlled by their subconscious minds. So if they're thinking about something else or they've got a bad thought about you, then they just, uh, they ignore you or dismiss you or criticize you or send you off or reject you in some way. It's not, they don't even try to do it automatically, they don't consciously, they just automatically do it because their, their love, the spigot of love, that little flow of love is controlled by their unconscious mind, not by them personally. They don't even know it. But sometimes personally, as soon as they hear your voice, they, I don't want to talk to you, they push, you know, push the button and, so, and so you, get, you get their answering phone, say, sorry, I'll call you later, da -de da something. Isn't it? 
Now, if you have, if you have a personal deity, what you do is this. You, you bring God down to your level. <laughs> you bring God down to your level and you develop a relationship with God. And, and why? God is a great person to have a relationship with. Why? Because God's always present and God always listens and God never judges you. Hmm? Right? God understands always what you're thinking, hears every word that you say, and never criticizes you or rejects you, does it? This is why devotees have personal deities, are pretty happy. Huh? They're pretty happy people. Their husbands and wives don't look after them like God looks after them. And they can say anything they want to God. And God's not going to but get angry. I tell, I tell God off all the time. I'm, I'm constantly telling God, what, you know, what's wrong with you? I told you I want this and you're not doing it. Get on with it here. Don't you know who I am? I'm the great Ramji. How dare you put me in a room with all those morons, all those fellows over there. You fix this up right now, Lord. And does the Lord stop loving me? No. no. Huh? The Lord puts his thought in my mind to get off your butt and go tell them your problem and they'll fix it for you. And so I oh, thank you, Lord. That's a good idea. I'll go and do that. So I get up and I go down and I complain and suddenly I'm in a different room. Huh? Nice quiet room. Internet working very nice. No noise, nothing, everything fine. But, huh? huh? Ask your wife to do that, ask your husband to do that. Well, maybe they'll listen, maybe they won't. If they're too busy, you won't get anything from them. God you, does. Huh? God does by telling you. <laughs> yeah, God talks to you. <laughs> God gives you a solution, huh? And God's a friend. God listens to you. You can, you can have any kind of emotional mood around God. And God's not going to have a problem. And that's cathartic. That, that's freeing. That's liberating. You can't say things to your husband or your lover or whatever it is. There's some things you can't say. If you say them, you know that it will be trouble. But with God, you can say everything. Huh? So there's this purification of your mind. There's this release. This happiness that comes when you have a personal deity. When you have a communication. The problem is that you've dragged God down to your level. You haven't gone up to God's level. Right? But that's okay. At least it solves an immediate psychological issue. Now, in this, in the, in the love of object stage, huh, you're, a, you're a materialist, you're an atheist, your mind is dull and disturbed, and you're full of attachment to objects. That's the problem here. In this, in this stage, where you have a personal deity, what, what do you do? What, what do, you do? Huh? Well, you listen to God, you communicate with God, you read the Bible, the holy books, and so forth and so on, you pray, and this and that, and so on. You, you have a religious life. Hmm? <coughs> religious, hey, religion's a problem, but the religious impulse is beautiful. And living a religious or holy life is a beautiful thing. Never mind the church. You can, if you don't have the church, you know, if you're going to the church and, and the priests are molesting you, well, then obviously you don't want to go to the church. But that doesn't mean you can't live a spiritual and religious life outside of the church. So in this level, what do you do? You, you, you have your own personal religion. Or you, believe, you, you follow a religion which is non, a decent religion. There are some good religions that are fine there. And you follow dharma. What does dharma mean? You don't break the rules. The creation here is nothing but rules, laws. They're called dharmas. In this, when you love objects, you're tempted to break the rules. Why? See, God is, God is, God is what creates all the rules here. 
They're called dharmas or laws, principles. This is a, a lawful universe. Okay? It's lawful. It's a physically, there's laws here. Mm -hmm. The law of heat, the law of sound, the law of light, the law of gravity, the law of time and space, causality. There's all kinds of laws up. There are material, physical laws operating here. It's totally impersonal. If you stick your finger in the fire, you will get burned. Because fire always is hot, it burns. That's it. That's a law. If you don't like it, it doesn't matter. If you don't like God's law, it doesn't matter. God doesn't care whether you like it or not. God's going to do what God's going to do, whether you like it or not. That's just the way it is. And there are psychological laws here also. Rules. We're explaining some of the psychology of a human being. This is a psychological law about desire and action and results and all of that. These are psychological laws that are operating here. Fear and desire, projection and denial. These are psychological facts. That's why you have psychology now. Starting with Freud, you started to have psychology in the West. In India, they had psychology long before they even knew America existed. And you have moral laws here. Universal values. They, they apply across the board to everybody, every place at every time. They're the same. And when you have a lot of desires and fears, huh, sometimes those laws get in the way of getting what you want, right? Huh? So what you will do is you're, you'll have a tendency to maybe break those laws, not pay your taxes. Tell a little lie. Hmm? Steal a little something. Cheat here and there. This, uh, huh? Cut a corner. You should go like this and like this, but what? You go across the corner. Did you ever notice that? In the cities, in the, in, where there was a vacant lot, they have a sidewalk. That's where you're supposed to walk. That's where they want you to walk. But, the, but across the lot, there's a path. Why well, people don't want to go all that trouble, they want to cut the corner, huh? Saves time. So when you're after objects and your desires are, are, are uh, torture, torturing you, your desires are torturing you, huh? That's why you want to act quickly, huh? You want to get, you act quickly and you want the result quickly because desire is painful. You want to get rid of it. So, huh, if it takes too long, huh, if it takes too long, you're in more pain. But if you can cut a corner, then you shorten the period of your desire or your fear, huh, and then you've gained, you think you've gained, but you haven't gained. You've broken a law. And you feel guilty. So here, these people that love objects are full of guilt. If you have guilt, then you're breaking some laws here. You don't even know you're doing it. It's not your fault, really. You have to, as you become more aware of who God is and what God's laws are, then what? Then you love God, you want to what? Follow God's laws, obviously. Never mind human laws, but God's laws are number one. Human laws are good to follow, Sometimes those are equivalent to God's laws, and sometimes they're not. But if you follow God's laws, you're not going to feel guilty. You're going to feel good. But when you're full of desire for objects, huh, you want to cut corners. You need to get those objects because you need to get rid of that fear and that desire, which is disturbing you. That's a psychological principle I'm talking about. It's the law. Understand? Okay. Well, Dharma. And you can, you can relate to God any way you want to here in this, in this stage of devotion. You can hug God, you can kiss God, you can cuddle God, you can get angry at God, you can, there's a million little games you can play with God according to your nature. It's fine. Right. 
uh, and you, but what are you, in this, in, in this type of devotion, you are against knowledge. You, huh? You don't want to hear about anything other than what you believe and think and feel. You're narrow-minded. This is why in religion, you've got the, these jihadi people. They just kill you. Now, if they just actually thought about God for a few minutes, they'd see that God created everybody, that we're all God's kid, children, and that they're God's children, that the God they worship is non different from the, uh, all the other gods, that everybody's worshiping the same God. That's right, there's only one God. Well, we say there's only God. We don't say there's only one God, because that makes a little problem. But there's only one God. We're all worshiping the same God. And then why should I kill you? Because you don't worship my gods. Huh? They don't want to hear that. There's only my God, and anybody who doesn't worship that is what needs to be killed, needs to be destroyed, is my enemy. That's what we mean, knowledge of verse. They don't want to hear about a loving, kind God. People in, in this, they're very ignorant. In fact, in, Veda, in the Vedic spiritual world, people like uh, me, like the non-dualists, by the, by the most of the devotees there, they call us Mayawadis. It's a, it's a, it's a bad, bad word. Mayawadis. And it means, it means what? These are people who believe in Maya. They follow Shankara. They're non-dualists. You can never, ever attain union with God. You're always separate from God. God is an eternal principle, and Jiva is eternal principle, and never the twain shall meet. People who tell you that non-duality is a true, they're evil people, they're bad people, you should not follow them. And so they criticize us. They won't talk to us. They write all sorts of bad things about us. Because they believe, huh? They don't want to hear non-duality. Oh, no, 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 no. Even the Bhagavad Gita, which is the text they use, they ignore repeated statements of non-duality in the text made by the God they worship. The God they worship is called Krishna. He's the supreme personality of Godhead. That Krishna talks non-duality non-stop throughout the the Gita, and they ignore every one of those statements. They're not interested in knowledge. They want to maintain themselves as separate entities. <coughs> and their argument is, what is their argument? Why would I want to be God? Why would I want to be God? I want to enjoy God. Yeah, I ought to eat. Yeah, it's more fun. If you are God, then how can you enjoy God? This is their thinking. It's stupid thinking. There's no, there's no contradiction between enjoying God and being God. There's no contradiction at all. But they imagine that there's a contradiction because they, they don't like to use their brains. They don't like to think. They're not, they don't want to gain knowledge. Knowledge is too difficult for them. They're emotional people. And they're experience-oriented. And feelings mean everything to them. They're feeling-oriented people. So they don't want to hear. Anyway, let's take five, and then we'll continue on with this, uh, with this uh, discussion.